Hi, welcome everyone. This is Jim Kirkland. I'm going to be speaking about a new class of compounds called senolytics and their potential use for chronic HIV syndrome and many other conditions. So cellular senescence is a cell fate. Uh, it can occur at any point during life. It occurs across the vertebrates and even in some invertebrates. It is a response to uh, damage. And this damage can be from repeated cell division. It can be from developing uh, cancers within cells. It can be from mechanical or shear stress. Mechanical stress is the basis for senescent cells forming in the knee joint, for example, in osteoarthritis. It can be caused if neighboring cells die. It can be caused by inflammation. And importantly, it can also be caused by what we call PAMPs or pathogen associated molecular pattern proteins. In other words, things associated with infections. So it's, it's a cell fate like replication, differentiation, or apoptosis, but unlike other cell fates, it can take a week to six weeks for senescent cells to appear. So it's a, it's a slowly developing cell fate. There are a variety of factors um, which can transduce the signal, the damage signal to the cell and activate programs related to senescence. Uh, and, but there are multiple different intracellular programs that can do this. And what this means is that there's no single marker that's completely reliably sensitive and specific for senescent cells. And sometimes it's hard to say which cell is senescent and which isn't. Now, senescence is a necessary process for a lot of things to occur. Um, for example, senescent cells form in the placenta of the mother and produce factors that drive the baby through the birth canal. Uh, senescence is important in wound healing, and it's important in preventing cancer development. Conversely, if senescent cells persist and are not removed, they can cause dysfunction. They're normally only removed by the innate immune system, by natural killer cells. They're very resistant to dying. Uh, in fact, they're metabolically very active. And most, if not all, senescent cells can develop something called a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. Um, I'm just going to call it SASP for short. About 30 to 70% of senescent cells have a tissue-destructive SASP. The other 30 to 70% have a SASP which can promote tissue um, uh, growth and wound healing. And it, it's the, the SASP is what appears to contribute to tissue dysfunction if there's an accumulation of persistent senescent cells. Now, senescent cells accumulate with natural aging, but in healthy elderly individuals, even um, the, the numbers of senescent cells can be quite low. What, they tend to, what senescent cell burden tends to correlate with is frailty and multiple disease states. And as I mentioned, senescence can occur at any point during life. For example, it's looking like Down syndrome, which begins with aging of the egg cell in the mother, is a cellular senescence-related condition. So literally from before birth on, senescence can contribute to a variety of conditions. If we transplant even very, very small numbers of senescent cells, such that only one in 10,000 cells in a transplanted mouse is a senescent cell, those mice can develop frailty as um, indicated by reduced running speed on a treadmill, reduced ability to hang from a wire and reduced grip strength. And these mice transplanted with very small numbers of senescent cells. And incidentally, the senescent cells are made by taking cells from the mouse's own ear and exposing those cells to radiation or not. And the radiation induces senescence. Um, after a lag period, after transplanting fairly small numbers, say a million senescent cells into a middle-aged mouse, the mice die early uh, compared to mice that are transplanted with sham radiated um, cells or that aren't transplanted at all. And they die early from every disease that a mouse dies from. So like other fundamental aging processes, it looks like cellular senescence can be a root cause contributor to many conditions, in fact, the bulk of conditions that cause most morbidity, mortality, and health expenditures. Now, there was an important paper that came out by um, Ned Sharpless. He just stepped down as director of the National Cancer Institute in the United States back in 2004 in Journal of Clinical Investigation, where he showed that 
senescent cell burden increased with age as, as other people had shown in mice in this case. And he showed that caloric restriction, which is something which improves health span or the period during life um, where there's independence, freedom from disease, freedom from disability. Uh, and that caloric restriction not only increased health span, but in concert with that delayed senescent cell accumulation. So that led us to ask back in 2004, is this relationship between senescent cell burden and decreases in health span an association or is it causal? And so we began to search for ways to try to uh, specifically remove senescent cells, those senescent cells that accumulated but weren't removed by the immune system and, the, and mainly the tissue damaging form. We tried all kinds of ways of doing this, including making fusion proteins with antibodies that would bind to the senescent cell and carry a toxic cargo and got nowhere. Uh, we tried high throughput screens, got nowhere. Then it hit us that those senescent cells that are tissue destructive are killing cells around them, but they are themselves not dying. They're resistant to the things that they're using to kill cells and destroy tissues around them. And this reminded us of what happens with acute lymphocytic leukemia and B lymphomas, where the cells produce things that harm tissues around them, but don't die. And they don't die because they have protective pathways that defend themselves against committing suicide. So we used back in May, 2013, very early proteomics and bioinformatics approaches to ask, are there pro-survival networks in senescent cells that allow those senescent cells that are producing damaging factors to survive. And we found indeed there are, we call these SCAT pathways or senescent cell anti-apoptotic pathways. There are now 10 of them. We discovered five initially uh, and they're interlinked in a network. And the next thing we did was we used RNA interference approaches to knock down key nodes on this um, pro-survival pathway network. And we found that different kinds of human senescent cells depend on different pathways within this network to defend themselves against things that, are, would, would, that they're using to kill cells around them. And by disabling particular nodes in what are called MSCs or preadipocytes from humans that were made senescent by radiation, we found that efferin-dependent SARC kinase pathways were critical in defending these cells against uh, committing suicide, the 30 to 70% that are pro-apoptotic. We found that BCL2 family members were not involved. We found certain serpenes and other uh, pathways were involved in this particular human cell type. In another human cell type called HUVEX, or human umbilical vein endothelial cells were also made senescent by radiation. They depended largely on BCL2 family members uh, and also heat shock proteins. We next used early programs at the Broad Institute to look for natural products or drugs that were um, already on the formulary and that had short elimination half-lives that would target the same things as the RNA interference studies did to kill particular kinds of senescent cells from humans. One of the agents we discovered as senolytic is dasatinib. It's been on the formulary since 2006. It's used for treating certain cancers and off-label for scleroderma. And we predicted it would kill human senescent preadipocytes, but not endothelial cells. And that turned out to be the case. It killed the 30 to 70% that were tissue damaging. Another agent that we found early on was carcetin. It's what makes apple peels taste bitter. It's a natural product, a flavonoid. We predicted it would kill human endothelial cells, but not preadipocytes. That was turned out to be the case. The combination killed both cell types. So um, since then, uh, and we originally discovered 39 compounds using this approach. They all turned out to be senolytic. And since then, many more have been discovered using this mechanism-based hypothesis-driven approach that we originally used. Since then, um, second-generation high-throughput screens and other approaches have been developing, have been uh, used to discover uh, senolytics. Now there are several hundred uh, senolytics around, and there are well over 100 companies working on them. So if we transplant labeled senescent cells in mice, so they emit a light signal so we can see them. If we give oral desatinib and quercetin, uh, just a single dose uh, to mice, we're able to kill the 30 to 70% of senescent cells that are tissue damaging. Whereas if we uh, give it to mice that are 
uh, transplanted with non-senescent cells, we don't kill those cells. If we take human fat tissue from younger obese diabetic women who have a lot of senescent cells in their fat tissue, and we expose that fat tissue to senolytics for a very short time, two hours, that's sufficient to cause senescent cells to enter an irreversible process of apoptosis, which takes 18 hours to kill the cells. So a very brief exposure is, is sufficient to kill senescent cells. Those uh, transplanted mice if I talk, uh, that I talked about before, if we treat them with senolytics after transplanting them with senescent cells, we prevent their frailty and we prevent them from dying early. So since um, we originally discovered senolytics, there are now about 70 conditions in preclinical models in mice, uh, monkeys, and other animal models, and uh, human uh, tissue explant and cell culture models, where it looks like there might be a beneficial potential effect of senolytics if used in the right way. So we established something called the Translational Geroscience Network, which is funded by the National Institutes of Health um, I happen to be principal investigator on it and it involves the institutions that I've listed here. And what we're doing is multiple clinical trials of senolytics and different types of senolytics at that, and also what we call senomorphics. So these are drugs like metformin and rapamycin that act in part by inhibiting the secretory state, the SASP of senescent cells, and also other agents like NED precursors, um, sirtuin agonists, uh, CD38 inhibitors, and others what we call gerotherapeutics. These are drugs that appear to target fundamental aging processes. One of the early clinical trials was in a condition called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is associated with extreme frailty. It's a senescence-driven disease of the lungs. It's an open-label trial, very small, no placebo control group, but it looked like we decreased frailty in a very small number of subjects with a few doses of oral desatinib and curcetin. In um, obese younger uh, patients with diabetes, we found that we could clear senescent cells from adipose tissue after three days of treatment with oral senolytics. We uh, did a second fat biopsy um, at 11 days after the last dose of these drugs. The drugs are long gone by then. And we found decreases in markers of senescent cells in their fat tissue, decreased inflammation, and decreased fibrosis. We found blood composite scores uh, indicating senescent cell burden were decreased in these subjects after um, uh, three days of these agents. So there are now 30 clinical trials underway, and they're for everything from space travel to um, uh, childhood cancer survivors, because uh, cancer treatments induce cellular senescence in some of these people when they reach age 35 or 40 after having had chemotherapy before the age of 10, are dying of Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, uh, they get osteoarthritis, they're getting diabetes, they're frail, um, they look like they're 70 when they're 35. There are three trials underway for coronavirus. Um, there are trials underway for Alzheimer's disease and a range of other conditions. Now, one of the trials, which is about to begin, will be um, mainly based at Northwestern University in um, Chicago, and that'll be for persons with um, HIV, in other words, chronic HIV survivors. And we know that um, this condition is associated with increased senescent cell burden, and that this increased senescent cell burden in people with chronic HIV is associated with frailty, impaired physical function, and memory loss. So, um, what we're, um, and we know that HIV infection and antiretroviral therapy can both induce cellular senescence. So, in this trial, we're looking at people over age 50 who've been diagnosed with HIV for at least 10 years before. Uh, and have been on antiretroviral therapy for two years uh, and are uh, virally suppressed, but are fra frail or pre-frail uh, using a four meter uh, walk test. And this will be a phase two multicenter 36 week uh, randomized crossover trial of oral desatinib and carcetin, those agents that I showed earlier. And the impact, we'll look at the impact on physical function. Who knows what it'll show, but the trial is about, to, we're hoping, hoping it'll begin soon. And there's some other trials beginning looking at um, chronic HIV in other ways. So in conclusion, persistent senescent cells appear to cause inflammation, fibrosis, progenitor cell dysfunction, spread of senescence, which I didn't go into, and they appear to accumulate in chronic HIV. The target of senolytics is senescent cells, not a single molecular pathway. We can give these drugs intermittently because it takes a week to six weeks for new senescent cells to form. It looks like they attenuate tissue inflammation and fibrosis. 
Um, a hit and run approach, as I mentioned, may be effective. They appear to delay, alleviate, or prevent um, or treat multiple chronic diseases, acute diseases, and disorders in mice, but we don't know if they work in humans yet. I'd emphasize they should not be used in humans until we've done carefully controlled clinical trials. So physicians should not be prescribing these agents. People shouldn't take them over the counter until we know if they work. And I'll just conclude by thanking an awful lot of people who've been working on this project with us, especially Tamara Chaconia and Izu, who were involved with me in finding um, Senolytics. Thank you very much.